Morning. Um, yeah, we've spent part of a year. Right? We've been invited to think, go back to first principles, thinking about questions, which is a really nice thing to do. And um, what we came up with, I think, in the first part of this talk, which I'm going to deal with, was a framework, uh, which was sort of trying to work out how do questions that have a, maybe a summative purpose uh, also talk to things which might have a formative purpose, or you know, sort of that sort of language we started with. And we were trying to think about what does that mean for richness, because that was the sort of question we were asked initially. And then in the second part of the talk, which Simon's going to deal with, we're going to talk about some of the contextual factors which might be a, a facilitator or maybe a hindrance to some of these things happening in the classroom. So hopefully not too complex. Um, and you're going to get sick of questions today, I'm sure. But here's another one. Um, I wanted to draw attention to, really, when, when we go back to the first principles, we drew upon a conversation analysis framework. Um, this perspective was really looking at the sort of sociology of how questions work. And what we were really interested in was when questions work, they seem to be rule-bound. You know, people are conforming to certain rules. And what happens then is something is, is an outcome of that, which becomes a resource which people can then use for various purposes. And so what we were interested in is just thinking about some of those rules in the first, in the first in, in instance. So this is me in the canteen when I go for a coffee in the morning with somebody who I don't really know that well, but they say, how are you? And I say, fine, thanks. And that looks really, really natural. It's sort of, you know, we, we all recognize that. And the reason why we recognize it, you know, uh, R.V. Sachs, Manny Shegloff, way back when they studied this stuff, said, you know, it's because we all know the rules. We all play by the rules. Um, and some of the rules that underpin this are things like uh, adjacency pairs. So when you say something, you sort of impose power. You, have a, you exert power on the recipient because they need to respond in a way which you've sort of limited what they can say, what's acceptable. And you hand over the power to them to sort of come back. And in the classroom, this is really noticeable, I suppose, within the work of Meehan, Sinclair, and Coulthard, again, back in the 70s, when they looked at the amount of initiation and response and feedback structuring which went on with teachers questioning. Um, and in some ways, that's what we would look at as a sort of institutional type of talk, because there are specific rules about that. That's one of the few places maybe where, when someone asks a question, the person who answers it knows that the person who asked the question knew the answer in the first place. So it's a really weird sort of question, whereas this is sort of more natural sort of everyday conversation. So we have that. We also have the idea that um, there's a preference for agreement. So when someone asks you a question, you want to give them something which they've sort of asked for. You want to conform to that need and satisfy that demand. Um, and we do that all the time. And when it doesn't work and there's an awkward moment, we know we've broke the rules, and this is where it gets really interesting. So I'm back in the canteen, and this time it's me asking the question, so how are you, to a colleague who I don't know very well. I know she's from somewhere in Europe. I'm not getting all Brexit or anything. But I ask the question, and I get all sorts of stuff coming back about colleagues, deadlines, uh, not feeling very well, and all of that sort of stuff, which I wasn't really ready for. You know, I, and I'm thinking, how do I deal with this? And that's because all of a sudden the rules have sort of been broken in this, this contract which we've set up. Um, and so that's just a sort of demonstration of that we do have a sort of rule-bound structure about questioning. And when it works, it works well, and we get a resource from it. And, and, and then I turn to this idea of resource, so what comes out of it? And I think, you know, I, I look to sort of Neil Mercer's work with Derek Edwards again way back, which is saying that, you know, when you ask a question, it, the respondent finds, you know, you find something about the respondent. You find out something about what they know or they don't know. But actually, the respondent always also finds something out about the questioner because they're sort of setting this up. So actually, what you're doing is establishing some sort of common ground between you both, which you can work on. It becomes part of your sort of background. And that reminds me of some work that's coming out of Cambridge at the moment, Christine Howe and colleagues, where they're saying, actually, within the classroom, when, when children are, are engaged with uh, active querying, you know, so that asking questions of each other and eliciting and rationalizing, there are gains to be found in terms of standardized me measures of English, maths, and science. So there's something very powerful about the way that questions work and when we use them in those sort of, in those rule-bound ways. So what do we do? We, we try to look at our framework in from first principles, as I said, and what we first of all did was to say, well, you can think about richness as a number of things. It's used quite loosely. Is it about the openness of questions, the amount of information that's, that comes out of them? Is it about higher order thinking? So we came to, to an, a point where we thought there's something about alignment in our, in, our, in our approach. 
And it's the alignment of certain things that, when they work together, there seems to be a richness about the question. So we took the approach of looking at orientation as our first starting point, and then purpose, and then outcome. And for orientation, when we, when we look at that, we drew on Paul Newton's work of 10 years ago, where he said, you know, you have performance-orientated questions which maybe lead you to being able to make a decision about a judgment about somebody's ability, so about what their performance tells you about what they know and what they understand. But if it's a learning-oriented question, you'll probably be looking at something which helps you to make a decision about what to do next in that learning journey. So what, what do you need to act upon? And so we took that as our starter and said, we want these two things to be represented in our framework. So let's think about the performance-oriented first, which is sort of more akin to the summative sort of use of, of questions. And so we felt that here we have an orientation which is about trying to elicit something about what somebody knows. The purpose of that is really to try to make a judgment about that so we can infer something about their ability. And the outcome of that leads us to make a, a grade or a mark or some sort of judgment which then we can use to relate that person's understanding on a construct against somebody else's and we can sort of select or whatever. Now in this sense, when those three things are aligned, we would say this sort of richness is more to do with, it's quite akin to validity. The idea of what about this question leads the respondent to do the things you want them to do in the area that you're interested in. So the idea of trying to avoid something like construct irrelevant variance, putting things in the question which divert the candidates uh, thinking away from what you want them to think about. And Vicky, who's talking later, has done a lot of work on this, and she'll talk a, a bit more about this, about the features of questions which can interfere with this. Here we have a, an example of a question which, you know, could be a rich question in that sense, in that it asks somebody to talk about their, their economic knowledge of China and if the mark scheme is good enough, it'll allow them to sort of holistically sort of drop things into that space where you can make a judgment about you know, what they know or what they don't know and use that to make a grade or a mark on that. So that would be our first part of the framework. The second part, which is the learning-oriented part, is, you know, I, I think a bit more complicated. So what we're talking about here is having um, an orientation which is about trying to understand what that person knows, what they understand, um, so that we can do something about it, and so that it has an interactive quality. And I think that's something that we were quite strong on in this, in this framework. It actually is something that people act upon. And that could be a teacher, it could be the, the learner themselves. So when we look at the purpose, it's something about eliciting that knowledge or that understanding or indicators of that. And then an interesting thing happens. We, we felt that there were two... Simple, looking at simply two different ways that you can get an outcome from that. So on the left-hand side, we have the, the more simple sort of descriptive outcome. The idea of getting something which allows you to say, this, this describes what they know or they don't know. Um, and that can then be used to inform the next stages of learning. So the multiple choice question, which sort of parallels what, what Michael's just shown in one of his questions, is, is well designed because actually it gives you lots of information about if a, if a uh, respondent gives any particular response, what might be cueing their thinking? And what might you need to act upon as a, as a teacher or as, your, as the learner themselves? So it, it cues that interaction. But on the other strand, we've got... So, so that could be like convergent questioning, if you like. Or it's sometimes termed... Um, I forgot the word. But convergent. Um, re reproductive. That's the one. Um, those things have often been considered to be lacking in richness in a lot of literature. So Harry Torrance's work says, you know, that sort of stuff is, is quite a stretch to say it's rich. But in our framework, we say, actually, we can see that having a richness about it. And then on the other side, we have something which is more about exploration. This engages something about the learner's own um, engagement with their own learning process. So it's, sort of, it's got a developmental potential, which, of course, if it... If it gets played out on the social sphere, it becomes a verbally accountable thing which people can act upon, then actually teachers can work with this. But actually, it's, it's working with the learner themselves largely in the first instance. So we have an example here of, of a question which deals with truth. And that's sort of engaging the learner with what do you already know about this? Let's look at it from a different perspective, maybe. What does that, what does that do to your thinking? Where does that bring you? And these sort of questions have often been called divergent or, or productive questions uh, in the literature. So we've got those two different strands, if you like, within our framework. And I think they sort of make different demands on teachers or when they're used in the classroom. And I'll go quite quickly through this bit. Um, I'm not going through all of the elements, 
But you can see the sort of convergence on the left-hand side, the divergence on the, the right. And we're saying these are all about learning orientation, but they make different sort of demands. So for example, if we look at the outcome space on, on convergent questions, they can be much more well-defined. You know, you know what you're looking for with them, whereas the some more divergent type of questions are harder to pin down. There's a lot of things that might come back at you as a question designer or as a teacher that you have to be prepared to deal with. We have the idea of locus of control, where, you know, who controls the question? So in the convergent world, teachers have, question designers have, have a big say in that. Whereas in the, in the more divergent sense, actually, you're engaging the learner with their own thinking more. Uh, you're handing over some control. And there's elements of agency which get implicated in that, which are important to consider as well. You know, how engaging is it if you're always asking questions which are quite narrow and very well focused, but actually they're not allowing somebody to really articulate all of the things that they think might be really important to tell you about. So those are things that you might need to think about. And finally, what does it say about the teacher and the learner relationship? So what does it mean for a teacher if they've got a very convergent sort of question? It might mean the sort of the cognitive load that they need to have to interpret the outcomes might be lower. And that might have implications, certainly if you're, you're uh, you know, a more novice teacher or you're not so strong with your subject background, compared to those sort of questions which are much more divergent, where actually you might have to be prepared to deal with some sort of stuff which you might not be that comfortable with, but you want to keep it going. So those are some of the sort of tensions, I suppose, within the sort of the learning-oriented world. Um, and this brings us to our framework as a whole, so we integrate those things together. So there's nothing there we haven't talked about, but what is of interest, I think, is this notion of the convergent question, because the sort of whole model seems to converge around that. And this is, asks some interesting questions. So those questions that can be used to describe achievement and outcome, can they be repurposed? If you have a lot of questions which have been designed for, you know, for performance-oriented sort of outcomes, can you just throw them into the learning mix and use them for those needs? We thought about this because it's quite a tricky one. And we felt this really is about the quality of the outcome, and it's the quality of what comes out of it in terms of information. So if you're uh, talking about English and you ask uh, students some questions about their reading and writing, and it tells you actually their writing is stronger than their reading, that's OK. It gives you something. But actually, does it tell you what to do next? Not necessarily. So what you'd want is something in the reading domain, which is actually focusing down on the constructs of reading, which allow the teacher, the learner themselves, to understand what they need to do next. And as we know, if you've already given a mark or a grade to something in that sort of sphere, that's something that could undermine the potential for learning to take place because you know, it's taken the focus away from learning. So that's something that really needs to be considered uh, when we bring that model together. I think that's me. I'm going to hand over to Simon, who's going to talk about context. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, thank you, Martin. So in this part of the presentation, um, we were interested in broadening it out a little bit. So we were uh, initially in our original discussions, we were talking about the alignment between uh, question uh, orientation, uh, purpose, and subsequent outcome. Um, but then when we were discussing this we, and thinking about question use, um, we realized that there were a number of contextual influences that were probably driving um, the achievement of richness of, of questions in particular contexts. And, and, and this was, has been acknowledged previously by uh, Black and William and uh, more recently by Bennett in 2011, um, understanding that richness of questions is only a potential. Um, a well-designed question that has good alignment between uh, purpose and an outcome only achieves richness when certain um, contextual conditions are in play. And in this part of the presentation, we wanted to, to discuss um, this in a little bit more uh, depth. And so the object of the classroom question, um, its features and its intentions, only achieve richness when some things are, are achieved. Um, as Martin talked in the first part of the presentation, good alignment between the purpose, the outcome. Uh, when teachers themselves understand the purpose of the question, so why are they asking a question in a particular way, and how are they intending to use it when they, when they derive the, the resource of the information from the students. And it's this final part of uh, context that we'd like to speak uh, to you now about. So to, to try and illustrate this uh, visually, 
Um, we drew on some work from uh, the Russian-American psychologist, uh, sociologist Yuri Bronfenbrenner, and more recently from Gavin Fulmer at the Institute of Education at, in Singapore. And they've conceptualized the effects of individuals within a, a broader system. And we wanted to relate this to, to question use in the classroom. Um, so there are three different levels that we've, uh, that we've got here. So the micro level, meso level, and, um, and macro level. Um, at the micro level, we're talking about the immediate school um, classroom context. So the, the relationship, the agency between teachers and students and so on. And some, some of the potential factors that might influence this are given at the bottom of the figure. Um, but other ones might include things like classroom facilities, classroom size, and so on. At the MISO level, um, we've got things related to uh, not immediately observable, perhaps in the classroom context, but influence it in, in different ways. So elements related to professional development, um, elements of curriculum, teacher accountability, and so on. And then um, these taken together constitute what we might call a school culture. And, and, and going to the, to the macro level, looking at uh, the broader context, so uh, that might influence uh, policy development and, uh, and so on. So we just want to go through some of these in, in turn um, this, this morning. So looking at the micro level first, uh, students, teacher, and, and the agency between them. Um, this relates largely to teachers' perceptions of how assessment works and how questioning within that will, um, will form and, and be used. Um, and also related to their assessment, what's known as assessment literacy or pedagogical content knowledge. Uh, uh, richness can only be achieved if the teacher understands how the question uh, purpose relates to the interactional um, effects or the, the, the follow-up, if you like, between the, um, between the question response and the, um, and, and the discussions with the teacher following that. Um, and a recent uh, systematic analysis by Heisink and coll uh, colleagues suggested that assessment literacy and pedagogical content knowledge feed into um, the, the use of questioning, uh, teachers' use of questioning, um, particularly their identification of misconceptions and, um, and their use of feedback. Uh, another factor is also experience. So uh, teacher experience, some recent work from Ongen colleagues suggested that um, when students, uh, when teachers have a greater degree of experience in, math, in a mathematical context, they're able to uh, use more probing questions rather than factual recall questions, and are able to plan um, the, the outcome space, if you like, of, of what the students are likely to respond in certain contexts, and be able to respond accordingly. So in this sense, they're, they're better equipped to, to um, ask questions that have an exploratory uh, element to them. There's also uh, learners involved in this as well, and Martin talked about in the first part of the presentation the, the kind of implications of a response that, that students um, are given by a teacher when, when they're asked a question by the teacher themselves. Um, and their engagement with a particular question and the cultural norms that underpin that is obviously an important factor to consider as well. And, and one thing that uh, Harrison and Black have argued that when there is a change in classroom practice, uh, maybe through some kind of implementation or professional development that the teacher is trying to enact in the classroom, it changes the social contract between the, the teacher and the students. And this brings us to the idea of, of teacher-student agency. Um, so the, the relationship is built um, through a lot of iterative interactions over perhaps a, a term, a year, or across many years. And um, some re recent research has found that there's often a, a direct and more hierarchical relation between the teacher and the student that's, that's reinforced through the use of questioning. Um, some work from My Hill and Duncan in 2005 suggested that 64% um, of the questions in the context that they were in, I think they observed about 54 um, episodes of uh, teaching between students that were in year two and, uh, and year six, um, that 64% of the questions asked were um, factual recall, and a high proportion of those were to do with classroom management, whereas only about 16% of uh, the questions had a, a kind of exploratory context as well. So uh, questioning in the classroom is unusual in the sense that, that uh, compared to the rest of society, um, in the sense that uh, there's a, an assumption that the teacher knows the answer to the question, and, and that can actually um, influence the, the hierarchical discourse. An interesting finding from the, uh, going to the MISO level, an interesting finding from my home, Duncan, was that actually questioning approaches changed over the, over the years in their observations. So for year two students, the questions tended to build on knowledge 
Uh, whereas towards the um, in year six, the, the question seemed to be aligned more with summative assessment. And in some sense, it was kind of a match fitness of, uh, of getting ready for the examinations that were, that were prevalent at the time. Um, and this has an interesting influence about the uh, implementation of curricula and the delivery of it. Uh, one of the um, interventions that's been tried in Scotland, the assessment is for learning, uh, some research done by Kirkton and colleagues, suggests that um, one of the reasons why it wasn't quite successful as perhaps they'd expected was that when they were trying to implement um, a formative assessment, assessment for learning um, agenda, it actually slowed down curriculum delivery and that mismatched somewhat with, um, with the demands of delivering the curriculum on time. And this obviously relates to teacher accountability and the, um, the tension in educational discourse that whilst formative assessment is seen as, as generally a good thing um, and can lead to uh, good learning outcomes, there's, um, there's an interesting use of data that's, that's um, been introduced into the use of formative assessment that might actually change the role of it. Um, so whilst it's formative for the students, it actually becomes summative assessment for the teacher because it's related to the, their um, performance, uh, judgments about their performance. And also professional development school leadership. So um, the, the culture that's been established within a school can actually lead to teachers having a, a different understanding of how assessment works in, in different contexts. And that's, this is something that Brown and Harris have uh, articulated in 2009. Um, particularly the use of data for ongoing uh, student uh, teacher monitoring influence of their conceptions. Um, but it's not necessarily a, a unidirectional effect. Sometimes the, the perceptions or the autonomy of the teachers can actually influence school context and school culture as well. Moving on to the macro level, um, it's well known that government policy can, can change uh, behavior in, in the classroom uh, and, and teachers' practices, so that the, the macro can affect the, the micro. Um, a classic example is accountability in the UK system. Uh, typically, the, in the old system, the, the focus on the, the CD students. And Michelle Meadows at Ofqual um, did a large-scale survey uh, study about how this accountability system affected how teachers asked questions in the classroom and how they used um, and how it affected teacher practices in a number of different ways, including the, the choices that students had um, in terms of the, the subjects that they were allowed to take forward to, uh, to GCSE and so on. And also the feedback and marking criteria that specifically related to controlled assessment. So the movement towards potentially teaching to the test and, and giving feedback based on marking criteria terminology. So this is a, a, dem a nice demonstration, we think, of how the macro, uh, so school accountability, affects uh, curriculum at the MISO level and uh, moving towards the macro level in terms of teacher practice. And another example here is from teaching policy in the USA and the, the kind of perceived mismatch between the, the um, external, um, uh, external measures of school effectiveness based on external uh, standardized testing and the, the initial assessment literacy initi initiatives that were established, in, particularly in pre-service training. So uh, Luke and Ballara suggested that it was misaligned in, in a number of different ways. Um, so the pre-service teacher training on assessment literacy was misaligned in terms of the day-to-day -day assessment practices that were influenced by the, the need to deliver a particular curriculum and policy steers that emphasized um, standards based on summative outcomes. So just to conclude in the last few minutes that we've got of this presentation, uh, Martin, uh, at, the early, at the early part of the presentation, suggested that questions have a critical role in educational discourse. And I, I don't think that would be a particularly controversial thing to say, but they, the, the power for these questions comes in their potential to implicate response from the student based on uh, previously established social conventions. And as a result of this, they're a powerful educational resource they can meet several purposes, and we've talked about the performance and the learning orientations as a result. But we've talked about richness and richness potential, uh, and it can be achieved in different ways. So in the performance orientation, it's, it's, we've argued that it's synonymous with uh, validity inferences that you might make about a student as a result of a, a number of different questions or items that have, have been well designed for, for this purpose. Uh, for learning orientation, it's, it's more an interactive um, element. So how the teacher uses the information developed for their own decision-making, 
for their, uh, for their own uh, pedagogical practice. But they both have a common characteristic, um, that they meet the intentions for which they were originally designed. But that being said, we've, we've tried to talk about richness potential as something that um, it, it, it's, quite, um, it's quite a delicate thing. Um, it can be enhanced, maintained, or lost, depending on the, the cultural uh, context and the various different factors that we've talked about at the, at the three different levels that we've articulated this morning. And as a result, it resides within a dynamic system, uh, something that um, any, any one of these different uh, levels of influence can actually Im improve the probability of a question will be used in the way which it was originally designed. Um, improving cl clustering questioning, just to finish up on the final, uh, final slide here, um, it's been well established that th uh, through uh, the formative assessment initiatives from 1998 onwards, that improving clustering questioning is actually a difficult thing to achieve. And uh, I think we've uh, established that uh, macro and meso level influences can actually have quite a powerful role on what happens in the classroom um, and, and the interaction between students and teachers. To, to try and improve classroom questioning in the future, I think one, one thing that we would tentatively suggest here is that understanding the interrelations between the different factors uh, that, we've, that we've talked about in this presentation today um, would, be, would be an interesting place to start. So understanding that a change at one level of analysis might actually be, be hindered or a barrier might be presented by another part at a higher level um, of analysis. Um, and an example of this is uh, perhaps the assessment for learning agenda in the early 2000s and that got hindered somewhat by the school accountability approach. Um, Tim Oates in the Cambridge approach to improving education suggested that to, to try and improve uh, classroom questioning and, and practice in general, um, it was important to, to think of and look at these interconnections between the, the different parts of, uh, of the system as we've articulated it. Um, so from where secure predictions can be made about um, how one intervention at a certain level will influence other ones at uh, other levels. Another thing uh, to, to think about, uh, going back to the, the immediate classroom context, is the idea of using um, or designing effective or uh, most effective resources as possible. Um, in, in the recent, in the 2014 paper, Why Textbooks Count, um, Tim Oates suggested that, that textbooks actually have a number of advantages in terms of the explication of curriculum content um, and, and the fact that they can embody certain models of learning of which questioning would be an, an implicit, uh, or sorry, an explicit part. Um, related to this is the idea of improving the consistency of questions. So Michael, in the early part of his, um, in his presentation, talks about hinge point questions, exit pass questions, and different uh, question techniques that might, might achieve richness in different contexts. And through the use of resources that we're able to understand things like outcome space and the interaction between teachers and students as a result of the outcomes of those questions. Um, resources such as textbooks can actually have an effective role in doing so. And I think on that point, we're just about on time. So thank you very much for, for listening. And um, yeah, we look forward to the debates later on in this, this afternoon. Thank you.